Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the Data Diversity webinar today for ways to optimize your business and drive impactful results through spatial analytics sponsored today by Altrix. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, he will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Lisa Aguilera and Jesse Cho. Lisa is a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Altrix. She is passionate about the analytics space and showing how innovative analytic technology can help analysts move past mundane data ta tasks, elevate their skills and expertise, and deliver ever-increasingly sophisticated insights. Jesse is a solutions consultant at Altrix. Prior to joining the Altrix team, Jesse was a business analyst and Altrix user for over two years. She understands firsthand the need of business analysts as well as how to maximize Altrix to drive faster business insights. In her current role, Jesse leverages her unique experience to help organizations realize the benefits of self-service data analytics. And with that, let me turn it over to Lisa to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. And welcome, everyone. I want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy day to join us. I do hope that you will be able to pick up some useful bits of information in some of the materials that we present today. Now, uh, before we get kicked off here on our uh, agenda, I just wanted to do a quick informal ask here of how many of you on this call are actually performing spatial analytics or using some of the location information in your data. You can just go ahead and pop it in the Q&A. Um, it'll help kind of guide our conversation today as well. So uh, to level set, we're going to spend a quick moment on explaining what spatial analytics is, and then I'm going to dive into four common use, ca use cases of spatial analytics to help you kind of think about other ways you could be using location-based information. Uh, then we're going to go into four different case studies of real-world examples of unique and varied ways that uh, analysts like yourself may be doing spatial analytics or deriving some of the location data and blending it with their uh, transactional or point-of-sale data in order to get new insights. After which, I'll pass this on to Jesse for a quick demonstration, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So thank you all for participating in the chat. I see a couple of you are actually doing spatial analytics, and a couple of you are not. So I hope that we'll, we'll cover both sides of the house in this conversation. So uh, for those of you who may not know, there is actually a secret underlying piece of information in most data sets. Um, it's the fact that 70 to 80 percent of all data has some uh, type of spatial component as part of it. And some of this location information is really there to give relevance to the data sets that you're using. Now, if you're not using this data to understand the where of things when you're performing your analytics, um, this is going to be a great session for you to understand why you would want to maybe tap into that. So, Tapping into spatial analytics is more than just mapping. It's more than um, creating, you know, drive time analysis. It's more than what you would typically see. It's really about helping you help organizations drive efficiencies in the offerings, in the operations, and in order to help enhance profitability within your organizations as an analyst. Now. Some seem to think that um, you really have to be an expert in spatial analytics or you have to know mapping or you have to have special mapping tools. And what we're going to talk through today and what we're going to showcase in some of the use cases is there's a lot of analysts like yourself um, at uh, other organizations that you'll hear more about today that don't have spatial backgrounds, that don't have um, big tools to do things with, but have been able to tap into the location information within their data sets to really derive some creative and deeper insights that have driven some really impactful bottom line benefits. Now, 
When you look at spatial analytics or location-based data, you can use it to do things like uh, customized location of services or inventory um, based on key customer habits within your organization. You can use it to help improve store service or asset location strategies. You can also use it to ensure availability and improve customer experiences that will help, you know, um, drive down uh, latencies or gaps in services within your organization. Um, and drive efficiencies in marketing and sales programs or offerings within your organization. So uh, let's take a quick look at one of our first use cases here. Uh, this one is a, it's a pretty basic one that can impact many organizations. So for those of you on the call, you know, how many of you actually do drive time analysis as of right now? And I'm not talking about point-to-point -point location analysis, I'm really talking about drive time, so taking into consideration routes and traffic and everything else as part of your analysis. You can go ahead and informally type in. Great, I'm seeing a few yeses. Excellent, uh, wonderful. So for those of you who are already doing this, you understand the value that this uh, does. For those of you I, I see here, a few of you are saying no, maybe not yet, maybe you should be looking into it. So let's talk a little bit about this use case. Um, drive time analysis is really important in terms of helping determine the physical location of a new site or a new building to evaluate competitive uh, um, mix in your area. Uh, it's also extremely important if your organization is, if you're working in an organization that um, uses real estate as part of a franchise model or something along those lines. Now, for those of you who went through the housing bubble in the last recession, I'm sure you can all attest to the fact that real estate is an expensive and risky proposition. Now, if you are in a hyper-competitive industry or a franchise-type industry or a chain-type industry, location, as you know, is key to the success of those organizations. And a good location can be competitive to acquire. It also can be quite time sensitive to acquire um, because it can be very difficult to find right commercial locations um, at the right price in the right areas uh, before competition comes in and sweeps it up. Now, to offset some of the real estate or location risk, um, location anal and analytics must balance ROI against some demographic information, area competition, operational costs, and changes to things like roads and zoning. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to use a, a bit of an example here. Let's say you're in a hyper-competitive market, an analyst that works at, let's say, a coffee chain. Uh, a lot of these variables take on an even higher level of importance. So. Using our coffee chain example uh, as an analyst working in an organization like this, if you were able to visualize and understand uh, the location selection risk, you could use spatial analytics to understand the interplay of key variables and help make suggestions in refining location selection strategy as more of this data starts to become available and as you start to become more comfortable with it. Now, one key way of determining a new location would be using drive time analysis, like I said earlier. This is important because um, you may have a location that may look physically close based on a straight line, but road by road, it may actually be further than you would prefer, your organization would prefer. Um, it may not even be tapping into the right maybe cluster of demographics that you're trying to target uh, within that drive time. That's why it's really important to use drive time analysis with, um, with your information of your user and demographic data you could also look at it in terms of competing options. So again, using the example, if you're an analyst at a coffee chain um, organization, you would have to take in considerations like restaurants in the surrounding area or other cafes or even other existing franchise locations and ensure that they're not situated too closely uh, and that the customer base in that region isn't gonna get cannibalized. So, what kind of data would you use when you build this type of analysis? You would want to pull in things like your customer loyalty program data, sales by 
store. Um, if you're if you were that analyst at a coffee chain, you would add parameters for competing businesses as well. You would then apply uh, drive time proximity to every geocoded customer address and location. Um, and then you'd look at the targeted customers segmented within a specific drive time from two potential locations. And more importantly, choose the location with most profitable potential if you're trying to build an analysis like this. Um, should you not have rich enough customer loyalty data or point of sales data, you could go further and augment your data using demographic and firmographic information. So bringing in something from Dun and Bradstreet, experience census, et cetera. Now, what type of analysis should you be looking to build when you're trying to do uh, drive time analysis? You really want to look at drive time. You want to look at cluster maps of users within a given area, plot mapping and competing offers, and potential customers who match key demographics within a certain drive time for your organization's specific um, offering that you're bringing to market. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview on drive time. Let's get into the next use case that location analytics can impact. It, this is really about mitigating risk and exposure, as well as really adapting to maybe disasters and being prepared and readiness within certain geographies. So in this case, we're going to use an exam, basic example of an insurance company. So if you're an analyst at an insurance company, you really need to be on top of your game when it comes to setting up premiums and mitigating exposure. Uh, spatial analytics is extremely invaluable for this, particularly in regards to disaster claims. So when performing this type of analysis, you would need a couple of data sets. So you would probably pull in your claim data, your customer data, your policyholder data, flood weather or seismic type data, depending on the uh, risk exposure you're looking to analyze, and something like property value. After all, collecting all of this data, you would then create various analytic views. So, for an example, if you're an analyst, or if you currently are an analyst at an insurance company, you probably already know this, um, you would want to understand the risk exposure for your company, let's say regarding earthquake policies. I'm from California, so this is a big thing for us out here. You know, how much risk is it going to be to cover certain um, households within a certain area for earthquake policies? Uh, you would do this by mapping the policyholders and geocoding their addresses from their policies, uh, and then you would overlay a map of seismic information that denotes fault lines and maximum probable magnitudes. So after you've kind of built out the seismic hazard map, you would then remix and reassemble data in new views on to really understand where do you have certain clusters, and you'd be able to pull that reporting information back to your business decision makers to really help them understand their risk exposure in certain areas. So the other thing that you would be able to do with using this type of data is if you are an analyst at an insurance company, for this example, um, you would want to set up response centers uh, after disasters. So one of the things is, again, here in California, um, earthquakes are a big thing out here, they're real. So how many households do you have within certain areas that would need that kind of response time from your insurance claim company? Like, do you have enough uh, staff in place to support those call zones in those areas where you need to quickly get to and make sure that you have not only the right response time, but the right number of support available within a certain area. So you could be able to take all of that information, uh, look at how your staff within your organization blend all that data together and pull these reports for your business decision makers that will really help them understand one risk exposure as well as support within a given area. You could also take all this data and then combine it with um, regions depending on your high risk and, and areas that you're facing in terms of claims and claims management and be much more proactive and effective in terms of determining premiums for your organization. So there's multiple ways that you can look at this. Um, similarly, you could take a different direction. Uh, real estate investors can use hazard data so if you're working at a big real estate firm or a big development firm, um, you could take this data, uh, embed it with the hazard data such as floodplain maps, and evaluate which 
properties are valued appropriately if uh, your organization is in the habit of, of purchasing land to develop on. Um, you could also couple this information with predictive analytics and data sets such as listings and sales price or school enrollment if you're looking at home development, crime and more. And you could forecast trends on property values in different areas with relative ease by tapping into a lot of this information and pulling it together. So third use case that we're gonna go into here. This one's a bit surprising. There's a lot of organizations that do tap into customer profiling in order to influence sales and marketing, but there's a lot of organizations that don't. Um, they don't take location information in order uh, as a factor and a data point in order to determine what they're gonna be doing from a customer marketing perspective or a sales perspective. So, when using location analytics for this type of activity, you're going to hyper-target sales and market activities to microclimates within a region, which will help them resonate a lot better. So you'd want to find out who your most loyal customers are within a given region. You'd want to find out what's the best ROI for marketing spend and where should it be targeted and to whom should it be targeted. And then, you know, who's most likely to purchase a certain product within a certain region. As we know, you know, people's uh, purchasing patterns and, and preferences actually differ quite a lot based on not just state to state or city to city, but often between county and counties. So what kind of data would you need to create this type of view? You'd want to tap into a lot of your customer data, your sales by location, your responsiveness by location, uh, and then again, you, you Best to overlay demographic and firmographic information on top of that. So Dun and Bradstreet experience and census to be able to really uh, paint a full 360 picture of not only just your existing customer, but potential customers within a given area. Now, uh, typically customer information is gathered as, you know, the, the point of sale or the time of transaction or via online surveys. Um, you know, where customers are required to enter their receipt transaction in, in, in exchange for um, a prize or a drawing of some sort. Or um, you may get this information from loyalty card data. But if you're faced with a challenge that the customer data you need is not part of your company's original collected data set, what should you be doing? So uh, for imagine if you are an analyst at a home renovation retail chain that wants to optimize marketing spend, your company decides it wants to target homeowners for renovation-related campaigns and renters for home accessory promotions, uh, but your current customer data set is unable to distinguish between renters and owners. So how can you really get that data and tease it out? Well, the secret is fuzzy matching. If those of you who haven't heard of fuzzy matching, Jesse will We'll talk a little bit through that in the demo. Um, fuzzy matching allows you to, to match data assets that don't really have common shared identifiers. Uh, and using a waterfall matching process, a user can then change their weights of possible data associations and refine the data until you have the highest probability matches and the best data possible. So this, this customer data can then be further enriched by overlaying it with third-party data, you know, something like experience household data, um, where you would get, you know, over 300 different variable sets for demographics or psychographic attributes. So some of the uh, analytics that you can perform once you've collected all this data is you, you could overlay drive time information with this. Um, you could see who should get which type of offers or coupons or promotions based on their proximity to a certain location, store location. Um, you could also determine purchase preferences and tendencies and use it to really drive uh, suggestions regarding inventory optimization based on the preferences of anyone within a given region. So for example, you know, barbecues, maybe you carry barbecues year round in most of the Florida stores that you have as an analyst, but let's say you're in Nebraska, barbecues in the winter time, maybe not such a great idea. Um, so really kind of customizing based on purchasing preferences within a given location is key in terms of streamlining your inventory and driving operational efficiency. 
Now, you can also um, use it to determine potential purchasing patterns. If you're using that Experian household data and overlaying it with your customer data to try and find, you know, potential people within your store and, and customize and determine your offering based on their buying habits, it's another way to drive insights using location. For our last use case that I'm going to talk through a little bit um, before we get to some of the real life uh, case study scenarios and some of the insights some analysts like yourself have been able to build is um, talking about how spatial analytics or location analytics can be used and tied to the placement of physical assets such as property. So not necessarily an actual store or location, but physical property, um, things like service coverage area. So for example, a cell phone tower placement. So if you were an analyst working within the telco business, you know, some things, some data that you may want to pull in to perform your analysis would be customer data, maybe coverage, tower coverage within an area, data bandwidth coverage within an area, uh, demographic information again in there, and then population density. And you would use all of this data and you could create a couple of different uh, analytic views. So you could create cluster maps of users within a given area, demographics of customers within a given area, spot mapping of coverage, and then drive time to specific locations. So again, if you're an analyst and, you know, for example, you're working in a telco company, you could be tasked with how do you optimally place cell phone towers to reduce drop calls. Uh, your company may send out drivers with devices to measure signal strength from particular towers and the range of that signal, and you would then take that data, uh, get that signal strength, plot it on a map, and see where your coverage is lacking. You could then use this data and map it and combine it with uh, population density, rows, and customer locations. Uh, you could use it and you would find ideal cell tower placements or even usage. But you could take that um, a little bit further. So you could take your organization's um, dropped call tolerances and iterate on this model. You can overlay this with factors such as negotiated lease rates for placing cell towers on buildings. Uh, the other thing that you could do, and an organization that we know of has done this for a telco area within New York, is they looked at the demographic information and customer information uh, within a given region, and they use that data in combination with their cell coverage as well as their data coverage to understand what types of coverage offering to make within given regions so that they weren't offering the best cell coverage and the best data plan coverage within their uh, areas in which the demographics skewed much more heavily younger. You know, they use the analysis to decide that the demographic of younger users actually ends up using data more and they don't use actual calls. So why would we want to increase our actual call coverage when we need to increase our data coverage? And we're able to really customize and optimize their service offering, offering that way by using the location data, coverage data, customer data, as well as demographic data. So now let's get into some actual analytic spatial use cases that hopefully if you are an analyst who has participated and done spatial analytic or location analytics may kind of um, see some creative ideas on, and how to how other ways to use and think about your location information when you're building your analytic insights. And for those of you who on the call don't have a spatial analytics background, these are analysts just like yourself. The majority of these use cases that I'm going to be speaking to don't come from analysts who have spatial analytic backgrounds or location intelligence backgrounds. They were able to perform these insights through a little bit of creativity and foresight in terms of how they're going to tackle their problems. So uh, the first case today I want to talk about is Cardinal Health. Um, this is a very interesting use case. The analysts at Cardinal Health did not have an actual spatial analytics background whatsoever. Uh, and one of the ways that they were using it was in the nuclear pharmacy division of Cardinal Health, and they were looking to improve the doctor-patient relationship for PET scans for oncology. 
Now, for those of you on the call who are lucky enough to not know what a PET scan is, it is a powerful imaging technique that is typically used to uh, diagnose and treat lots of diseases, uh, but most notably cancer. Um, and there are more than 1.5 million PET scans conducted each year. Now, the problem that the analysts were facing here wasn't the, the sheer number of PET scans that were being conducted. It was a little known fact that there is a huge logistics challenge uh, with PET scans, actually. And the reason for that is F18 is a nuclear medicine needed to perform these PET scans. And you have to have just the right amount of F-18 strategically placed around the country uh, to make it to the hospitals in time for PET scans because the F-18 drug actually only has a half-life of six hours. So Cardinal Health had the challenge of trying to figure out how to support any one of the 300 million people seeing any one of the 10,000s of physicians and any one of the 10,000s of hospitals or clinics in the country and ensure that they had this F-18 with such a short shelf life readily and available for their PET scans when they were there with their doctors. Now, how can they manufacture enough of this drug in a four-hour period and have it delivered on time without inconveniencing patients. And the other thing that they're trying to figure out is how to profit profitably price the drug, knowing that some of the SIT may actually not make it to its location due to its shelf life and it would be useless once it got there. Now, what they did was they used all of the data sources they could get their hands on, all of their Excel data, all of their CRM data, location data, hospital data, uh, patient data, um, number of appointment data, and they used this to analyze time of distance from the manufacturing to delivery, and they blended that drive time data with root information and shelf life data as a product to come up with optimized routes and drive times of securing and delivering the drug. Now, the power of tapping into not only just their traditional data sources, but looking at the spatial and location data as part of the process at Cardinal Health resulted in huge savings. The value of this analytic output um, really drove visibility into operational gaps that they had um, and increased efficiency by 100x and their first project saved almost 1.1 million in logistics fees. So I hope this is an encouraging story for those of you who may not have tapped into the location information of your data to just really drive home and understand how valuable it can be. Now, another use case that uh, we have here is Del Hayes. So if you are from the East Coast on this call, you're probably familiar with the Del Hayes brand. Uh, but for those of you who, like myself, live on the West Coast, you may not have heard of them before. Um, they are a food supermarket operator. They have over 1,500 um, supermarkets in the Eastern United States. And they operate under several names, like Food Lion, Hannah Ford, and Bottom Line Dollar Food Brands. Uh, they're also located internationally in the Europe market as well. So the analysts at Del Hayes, they support the strategy, marketing, pricing, uh, category management, merchandising, finance, and legal departments within Del Hayes. And a lot of the analytics that they use is spatial or location data for a lot of the insights that they do create. And they are a small team of analysts, but they have been able to create some pretty interesting things. Now, one type of analysis that they use location data and operational data is in test and control initiatives that they've taken on within Del Hayes. So really seeing what types of activities might be suitable for certain stores and then estimating the effectiveness of an initiative and change before rolling it out uh, in mass. So what they do is they take information and match store household in um, pre-period before the initiative and analyze the behavior after the initiative. So one of the initiatives that they did was with their Food Lion branch. Uh, the Food Lion branch had a Sunday flyer in a small local newspaper, and the organization wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of the Sunday flyer because they were spending about $1.5 a week on this flyer. 
Um, they, uh, the analysts at Del Hayes established a test market that would not receive the Sunday flyer. And they pulled any locations from that test list that had major things happening, like opening, closing, remodels happening, or stores that had um, a typical high season volatility. What they did is then they used the location data for a lot of these to create uh, tests of using the flyer versus not. And what they resulted in was the test of where the flyers were working um, actually showed a positive lift. And they figured out there were certain demographics and areas where the flyer was not working. So in the areas where they did see a positive lift, they resulted in a minimum of $1.4 thousand dollars per share per week in sales lift. Um, so in the store that it did not work, and what they did was they stopped uh, using the Sunday flyer and optimized their marketing spend and eliminating this in what they found was it didn't work in urban areas. And that also resulted in a lift because they weren't inefficiently spending marketing dollars in areas where they didn't need to. Now, another uh, uh, test that they're doing with location-based information is they're exploring omni-channel service um, efforts and offering. So deciding if an online grocery shopping will work for certain locations and will provide a lift versus um, walking into physical, physical locations. And what they're doing there is they're taking their demographic information, customer loyal information, and considerations how far customers are coming from to perform this test. Now, um, sorry, before I get too far into this, I didn't call out. At the bottom of each of the slides that I'm sharing with use cases, on slide share is the analyst's full story of how they're able to perform these um, analytic use cases that I'm talking about, and they dive into a bit more detail than I'm diving in here. So if you are interested in you know, hearing a little bit more about what Dell Hayes is doing um, after the event, you'll have this slide. So you can click on those links there and find out more details. Now, the next use case we're going to look at is AAA. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with AAA and the services that they offer from some of the roadside assistance that they offer um, to the insurance, to the travel help and DMV support at some of their locations. I know I'm a big fan of their DMV support at some of their locations. Uh, the analysts at AAA actually use location data for a lot of different regions. They've been able to tap into some of the spatial components of the data sets that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, the AAA team actually did not have a team of spatial analytic experts when they were pulling all of this in. What they do is they use location data to help determine um, their clubs and what kind of services they're gonna be offering at their clubs, where to locate their clubs, they also use it to help um, understand the demographics and purchase history of their members near each branch office and location in order to better determine how to support or what offerings to introduce within key locations. Um, and they also use it from um, a physical uh, alignment of, of, of services and people who are there helping uh, at each of these club locations. So, you know, what are peak hours for members coming into certain locations and do they have enough people on staff or they, do they have too little people on staff to support those kind of high traffic times and high traffic locations? So AAA used a lot of their data, such as travel, ERS, auto buying insurance, vehicle repair data. They used income data, household count, and other census data. And they used it to really build out a comprehensive view of their customers and potential customers within surrounding areas. Uh, and what they've done is been able to really optimize the various service offerings of each membership location um, make sure that there's ease of access to them, make sure that the drive time and the distance is, is optimized, uh, and as well as I spoke to earlier that each of these services offered within each store area was optimized as well. They also use it for marketing needs. Um, so when they need to send out personalized communications to targeted marketing segments, uh, AAA does tap into all of their 
uh, existing day-to-day -day operational data, plus they tap into some of the location information in that data in order to drive deeper efficiencies. Let's see. The last use case, and this one is my uh, particular favorite. So if you do have time to check out one, I would highly suggest to click on the slide share and just kind of get a little bit more of a deep dive on the Cineplex story. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cineplex, they are a leading entertainment company in Canada, and they operate one of the most modern and fully digitalized motion picture theater circuits in the world, actually. Uh, one of the objectives that the analysts were faced at Cineplex was in identifying key audiences for new films before their release to inform key marketing, sales, and other business decisions. Now, the problem that Cineplex is facing is every week a new film comes out and there are very few data points available prior to release to really identify how successful or how popular a movie is going to be within uh, any given location. And the analysts were tasked with forecasting the demand for these films by location uh, because Cineplex wanted to improve the guest experience not only in the theater, um, but to also drive staffing decisions based on the demand uh, available for film products and make sure that they were more efficiently staffed predicting location-specific demands for films that played any given weekend, as well as made sure that they were um, accurately um, supported with their food and beverage in terms of actual materials and offerings that they had. Now, to further add to the ask, the analysts at Cineplex were also tasked with helping to suggest personalized marketing efforts for upcoming releases as part of their customer loyalty program. And the challenge that we're looking at was how to determine who to communicate which new releases without past purchase data available um, or uh, based on the type of movie that was being offered because they didn't have a lot of information to go off of. Now, what they did use was they did use their customer loyalty data. They actually combined it with film attribute data, so genre and rating, and they predicted the composition composition of the audience uh, based on 13 age and gender segments. Then what they did was they combined these results from 13 models to predict the percentage of demographic audience and identified key segments and created a forecasting module that consisted of multiple modules that worked together to produce a forecast for each film, location, and business day. Now, they then tested this forecasting model accuracy against a 52-week sample from the past and then used market basket analysis with advanced ticket purchase um, from loyalty members to identify companion films. And for each member, they generated an interest score for new movies using some of the consumer behavior data um, for companion films and other film attributes like actors, directors, and genres. With this, they were really able to address the request of their business leaders to optimize the user experience at each location. So before I get in, uh, let Jamie kind of, um, I'm sorry, let Jesse come in and uh, kind of show you how you can do this yourself, I just want to talk about what the one thing all of these use cases have in common. And what they have in common is what a lot of you guys on the phone have in common today. Some of them came from a mix of not having any location information background or spatial analytics background, and some of them came from it um, having had done some spatial analytic work. Um, the other thing that they, these uh, four use cases have in common is that they all used a solution, a self-service analytics platform that made it easy for them to actually take all of this location-based data and blend it together and create some of the insights they talked about. And one of the key ways that they did that is they explored um, spatial location data. It was really about using the right platform and solution to help them use location information and spatial data just like they would any other data set and really treat data as it is, data, independent on whether it had a mapping or, or a geolocation component to it. Um, the problem is most existing business intelligence and analytics tools today 
They, just, they do display some spatial data on a map, but they leave the analysis between the points up to a user, so not as well-rounded as most people like, and they can be a little bit challenging to use. Um, then there's the other side of the spectrum where you have more sophisticated but niche tools that exist for mapping and spatial analytics, but there's a select number of experts who can use these tools. They can be a little bit difficult to explore if you've never had um, exposure to them in the past. Um, you need to make sure that whatever you're using to perform your location intelligence is not narrow in scope or expensive or requires you to have to work with a different tool set to work with this data set versus the location-based data set that you're working with, or that requires you to actually turn to somebody else for their analytic expertise. You, know, you want to look for a true analytic workbench that will allow you to access and use all the data that you need to perform your insights, uh, regardless of the size or the format that you need for analysis, which is what those uh, four use cases that I just talked about did. You also want something that's going to help you geocode data quickly and easily. You'll want to help you perform inline visualytics. Now, inline visualytics is very different than um, visual output that you would normally get with Tableau. It's about helping you visually build out your analytic models so you can quickly iterate on them, quickly create specific analytic models, and then output your production to um, you know, a visual consumption platform or to a map or to a PDF. And then it, the other thing is you want to make sure that whatever platform or tools that you're using to perform some of your use cases, that it has the flexibility for you to use it in the way that you need to use it, and that you can analyze data in new ways and sh easily share that information in the way that it needs to be consumed by other users. So uh, for those of you who don't know about Alteryx, I'm going to spend a quick minute here. Um, Alteryx, it's, it's easy to think of Alteryx as a repeatable workflow for accessing, profiling, prepping, blending, performing spatial analytics, predictive analytics, and modeling all of your data. It's the comprehensive workbench. Um, it really empowers analysts of all skill sets to be able to access all their data within their organizations in a secure and governed way so that your IT departments and your data architecture and data managers feel safe with you being able to directly connect to the data that you're connecting to in order to pull the insights you need. It's a code-free way of liberating you to actually get to the answer faster and make your data work for you as opposed to you spending hours working on your data and help you create and think of new ways of using your data to answer questions that just weren't answerable before, like the examples with Cineplex or with Cardinal Health and empowering you to be able to perform really limitless kind of analytic models and address a, a tremendous amount of business questions that may come your way without limiting you because of the inline visual analytics that Alteryx offers as a platform. And then just as easy as it is to consume and connect into data, and we're very agnostic as to where that data is, it can be in the cloud, in a traditional data warehouse, Excel, Access, um, format, doesn't really matter our size, uh, Alteryx is actually agnostic in terms of sharing information and outputting that data, because what use is spending all your time creating an analytic insight if no one is there to actually consume it? like that old saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise? Your insights don't make any impact to your organization if people aren't actually using them. Um, so you need to be able to share them in a way that your business decision makers want to consume them. I'm sure many of you can raise your hand and say, you have to create reports ad hoc all the time, PDF, PowerPoint, something. Uh, Alteryx will help make that very easy for you. Some of you may be creating um, reports that need to get repeated on a regular basis and that are consumed often through uh, things like Tableau or Click or Power BI. Alteryx allows you to quickly output all of your analytic information into the visual platforms that your business decision makers want to consume the information on. Or it can help you write back to a data warehouse if you just need to do something really quickly and save that information for downstream. So with that, I'm going to pass this on to Jesse, who's going to show you um, a bit about Alteryx and how easy we 
uh, make the analytic process from end to end. Thank you, Lisa. All right, let me share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Or yes, Lisa can't you're through? coming through. Perfect. All right. So this is Altrix Designer. It's a desktop software solution. When you first open it up, you get this getting started. And we do have tutorials to kind of get you familiar with the tool. So you can open any of those up and walk through how you would build out a workflow. So this area we call the canvas. This is where you drag and drop your different tools. Down below is the results window. This is where you'll get any messages that occur while the workflow is running. To the left is the configuration window. This is where you'll configure each of the tools that you drag onto the canvas. So example, I bring in an input data tool, then this configuration window on the left changes. So this is where you configure each of the tools. Up top, we have the tool palette. This is where all the tools reside. They're broken out into different categories. So we have the favorites tools. These can be customizable, but most people start out with these favorite tools. We have our in and out tools, different preparation tools, joining tools, parsing, transforming, our in database tools as well. If you're processing a large data set and you want to utilize the processing speed of, for example, your SQL Server, you can actually do uh, processing in your data SQL Server and do some manipulations and joining and then stream it back out into your computer's local working memory. We also have reporting tools and then our spatial tools. So you can see there are also icons that you can drag and drop onto the canvas. And then we also have predictive tools as well and our connectors that can output directly to Salesforce. We also have connectors to SharePoint. So that's a brief overview of our tools. So here I have a pre-built workflow just because for sake of time. First, we have our orders table. So we have it by customer ID, order ID, store number, products, unit price, discount, and quantity. We also have customer data with customer ID, their address location. And then we have another input with our store information with address as well as latitude and longitude. So first we need to clean up our orders. We have some null values that we need to clean up, which we can do with the data cleansing tool here. We calculate the total sales for each row. And then we summarize our data based at the customer level. So you can see down here in the results window, we have customer ID, how many transactions they've ordered with us, their total spend, as well as what store they shopped at. Then we join the customer data with our orders table with the join tool. So now we know what location our customers are in. So here we use the street geocoder, which uses the TomTom data and indicate the address fields to get the spatial object, which is essentially all of our customer points here. So you can see in the browse that all of our customers are mapped out. They're in the Denver area. So we join these two data sets together. And then with the stores, because we have lat and long already, we can use the create point tool to create a point in Alteryx. Then we use the non-overlap drive time tool where we're creating a trade area essentially based off of a 10 minute drive time using the store's uh, point. So here we can see we've created these uh, trade areas based off of a 10 minute drive time for each of our stores. And then we're just renaming the fields here. So store point, and then we have our trade, store trade area. 
Then I want to see which of my customers are shopping within my trade area and outside my trade area. So to do that, I can use the spatial matching tool. And this will give me customers that match. So I have around 1,500 customers that were all within a 10-minute drive time of a store. Then I have these 800 customers or so that are outside that trade area. So I want to dive deeper into those customers. So here I just have another join tool to join back the uh, spatial information here with the customer point, the store trade area, and the store point. Then I wanted to calculate these customers, because they're outside the store trade area, how far are they driving to the store that they actually shopped at? So here I can use the distance tool, tell it which uh, fields I want to calculate the distance between. So I chose customer points and the store points. And then I wanted to output the drive time based off of peak hours. You can actually specify off-peak, night, or peak hours, so we have different options of the drive time calculation there. And you can also optimize your route based off of time or distance. And here are my units, I chose miles. With Alteryx, you're able to output data just as you are to input data. You can output to a flat file, to a database if you have write access to. So Alteryx respects the read and write accesses of your databases. So no one can access databases they don't already have access to. You can also summarize spatial objects as well. So here I'm grouping by the stores and I'm taking the sum of the spend, how much customers bought there, the average drive time, and the average drive distance by miles, and combining my customer points to essentially create a report here that would show me a PDF of which customers are outside each of the stores that they shopped at. So here's my PDF report. So I can see for store 100, these blue dots are my customers that were outside the 10 minute drive time. And the orange are each of my stores. So I can see that some customers, they actually live closer to another store, but for some reason they drove out to store 100 to buy a product. And then I have some tables here to show what the revenue outside the 10 minute drive time was and what it was inside. So we can see that total spend was a lot higher within the 10 minute drive time. And then those that were driving outside were spending at least 20 minutes to drive to the store. And this report is actually broken out by store number so I can see for each store, how far customers are traveling to shop at that specific store. So maybe that's something I need to look into for those specific customers. I can ask why they drove to a further store when there's actually a closer store to them. But I'm able to see that with this drive time analytics. So this concludes the demo, brief demo. We have some time for some Q&A. Thanks, oh, Jesse. Lisa and Jesse, thank you so much for this great presentation. We definitely have questions coming in already. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions, go ahead and submit them in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, and to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. So um, what will be some things to consider when looking at Altrex for spatial analytics versus the ESRI offerings? 
uh, with, I'm not, Lisa, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so there is a difference, um, and, I'll, and I'll give the example of Del Hayes. Uh, Del Hayes actually uses them um, in combination to, uh, together. Um, there is a bit of, uh, when it comes to being able to, one, access data that you need securely and uh, quickly without coding or waiting for your IT or data analytics department to extract that data, uh, Alteryx does make it very easy. We are extremely respectful of all of the data governance and access read write policies that organizations have in place, um, but it is quite easy for you as an actual analyst to access your data. The other thing that is a big difference is Alteryx is the full analytics platform workbench. So not only do you have a community, you can perform the data blending, you can perform the data cleansing, you can perform the data profiling, and it's not going to hang up on you uh, based on your data size, because that is one, one piece of feedback that we have for that certain uh, traditional spatial tools start to really kind of choke when you're working with larger and larger amounts of data, or you're bringing in lots and lots and lots of different data points. So we have many customers who actually use Alteryx as, if you will, their analytics engine in creating all their models and then outputting it out to things like Esri or MapInfo or things like that, um, or Tableau even for, for, for that matter. The other difference is Alteryx, as you saw with uh, Jesse's demo here, it is a drag and drop environment. That's what we mean by inline visual lytics. You get to do your full analytics workflow visually without coding. You can share this quickly and easily, and you can upskill your, your individual analytic ab abilities easily because prepping and blending data or profiling it is, as you saw in Jesse's um, screen here, is the same exact thing as spatial. You just drop a tool on the canvas and you're doing spatial analytics. It's the same with predictive as well. We have plenty of training courses that will help you upskill your predictive capabilities. Um, and you just can't get those with some of the more traditional spatial analytics tools. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what would be some of the things to consider when looking at Altrix for a spatial? Oh, sorry. I just asked that. Um, <laughs> so where can I learn more on the tool? Uh, there's a lot of great resources to learn about the tools. I think I saw some um, questions and chats coming in about, one, how do you know when to augment your data with demographic data, uh, and two, getting a little bit more in-depth about the spatial components and how to actually get them going. And the Alteryx community, as Jessie shows here, um, she can kind of pop up in the search, in the search window there. Um, great. Thank you so much. The Alteryx community is a wonderful resource to go to. You don't have to be an Alteryx customer. You can download the free trial and you get everything that you saw here that uh, Jesse showed. Um, and there are plenty of free training that you can sign up for. You can ask these specific questions on how, do, when do I know when um, to augment my data set to this uh, user group. I mean, we have thousands and thousands thousands of analytic experts that will answer your questions, not just about Alteryx, but just of analytics in general. So highly recommend that you uh, check out the Alteryx community to learn about this. And thank you very much, Jesse. This is the Lunch and Learn on Spatial Analytics. This is coming up this uh, week on Thursday. Again, you don't have to be a customer. You can sign up for this. You can download the free trial, and you can try and follow along and really get a bit more in-depth understanding of Alteryx and spatial capabilities. Certainly a great source of, a great set of resources there. So, you know, what processes do you use to determine uh, the enriched part of your flow? So, again, that's a great question. Um, I think that the best uh, place to really look at is here at the Alteryx community. You're, it's going to depend on what type of analysis that you're looking to do, um, you know, and, and what you're trying to augment, uh, I would very much highly recommend posting that specific question here. I think I also put it in the chat window too, a thread within the actual Alteryx community that did address this specific question. So if you'd like to check out the, the chat box as well, you can click on the link I put in there. And, you know, I certainly know the answer to this. I've done several webinars with you, and especially in joint um, in production with, um, but Tableau, the question is, is Tableau your product as well? But maybe you can talk to, uh, to that as well as you know, how you interact. 
You know, I'm going to let Jessie answer this question because she comes from an analytics background, and she actually was sitting in your guys' shoes not too long ago uh, performing a lot of insight work. So, Jessie, I'd like to hear your opinion on Tableau and Altry. Sure. So I was actually an analyst that I was at a company where we had Altrix server and Tableau server. So I would build out a workflow process that updated operational dashboards on a daily basis so that our operations team could go look at the dashboard every morning and determine if they needed to make any changes to scheduling for our part-time staff. So once I built out the workflow in Altrix, I was able to schedule these workflows and actually have them automatically update to Tableau data extracts. As you can see here, I have a Tableau data extract output, which then would automatically get updated onto Tableau server. They work hand in hand really well because Altrix is really good at manipulating, blending, and joining multiple data sets. And I was dealing with over 500 million rows of data. So for me to do a join on Tableau server, it was somewhat difficult and clunky. So I was able to utilize Altrix to do my manipulations, joins, calculations, because some calculations had to be on different levels of detail. And Tableau, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, you get that error that says uh, you cannot aggregate on a non-aggregate on different levels of aggregation. So I was able to do all those calculations within Altrix and then push it directly to Tableau. We also do have a Tableau starter kit that is a complimentary download as well where you can output directly to a templated workbook where you just update your TDE. So if you already have a TWB that's built and you just want to refresh your TDE, we can use this icon as well. And then we also have a polygon for Tableau to build out your uh, spatial visual dashboards. And we can output directly to Tableau server or Tableau online as well. And where did the time go? Since such a great presentation, I'm afraid we are at the top of the hour, however. So, um, uh, Lisa and Jesse, I can certainly send the remaining questions over to you if you want to review those. Thanks so much for this great presentation. Thanks for our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the questions coming in, as always. And just a reminder, again, to um, answer your questions, I'll be sending to all registrants by end of day Thursday the links to the slides, the recording, and the other additional links and such requested throughout the presentation. Presentation. Jesse and Lisa, thank you so much. I hope you both have a great day, and thanks, Altrix, for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day, all.